It's commonplace to talk of a great artwork in one medium suiting or inspiring great art in another. For instance, we might have an intuitive sense that Mahler's fifth suits Rubinoff's sculpture series one. Or that Claire Terry's soaring vocals inspired Deborah Pierce's paintings. Or that the infamous Bacon painting recalls the shocking scene from a well-known film. But equally, we might think certain sounds improve, enhance, or detract from the original work. For example, these two seem somehow mismatched. So we're comfortable with the idea of an artwork from one medium, such as music, suiting, inspiring, or complementing an artwork from another medium, like painting. And this fits with the orthodox view of our five sensory gateways established with empiricist thinking. The orthodox view is that each sense is an isolated pathway into the mind. Thus, colours and sounds will only inspire each other, but they will never meet or overlap. Recently, however, this orthodox view has come in for some scrutiny. There is now abundant evidence for the pervasiveness of sensory integration. It seems our senses do interact or overlap. For example, I can perceive the freshly brewed cup of coffee by seeing and smelling it, or perceive the explosion by hearing the bang, seeing the flash of light. And because our senses do interact in this way, some theorists argue that sense is a capacity rather than a system. Louise Richardson, for example, argues that sense is the capacity for experiences with a certain phenomenal and representational character. This places some philosophical weight behind empirical investigations that track participants systematically connecting the phenomenal character of sounds, spatial movement and shapes, at a sub-personal level. For example, the widespread tendency to name a spiky-shaped kiki and a roundish shape bubba. One can appeal to these kinds of investigations to postulate that there is a fundamental and shared subset of phenomenal qualities through which the senses are networked. Conceived of as a capacity, the idea of a specialist single sensing mode falls away and instead, individuation of experiences can be thought of as built up from outside in. What matters is the type of conscious perceptual episodes the sense is the capacity for having, because this makes room for the idea of a universal, deep wired and qualitative grid or network which the capacities share while this talk can be surprising to philosophers and academic psychologists, it's not really surprising to artists. Kandinsky, a pioneer of so-called visual music, hinted that his experience deeply fused noise and colour. But even artists might find it difficult to follow an instruction to imagine a sculpture made to be heard, or a picture that can be played on a banjo. This is because although many artworks are multi-sensory in the sense that they invite appreciation by sight, sound, movement and even touch, e.g. film and immersive theatre, it might seem odd to say a simple drawing is genuinely multisensory. We don't expect a drawing to look like the taste of strawberries, just as we don't expect warm vanilla to taste like triangles. So what do we mean by genuinely multisensory artworks? Are we talking about films, sculptures, expressive musical compositions? And when we say multisensory, are we postulating a strong claim about natural affinities rather than a weaker claim about suiting or inspiring? So far, we have said that it's natural to think that when your friend remarks on a painting, they will say something about how it looks rather than how it sounds. But given that multisensory appreciation is held to be the rule and not the exception in perception, we are asking whether we ever appreciate a work with a single sensory mode. Therefore, it's the strong claim about natural affinity that has motivated the Sound Pictures Conference, which is generously funded by a BSA Small Grants Award. And it brings together researchers from philosophy, academic psychology, musicians, and visual artists. Research projects start with clear research questions. Of course, the maturity of a research area affects how narrow those research questions are. And this project is particularly youthful. This represents a fantastic opportunity and affords the privilege of talking to stakeholders who are engaged in work that assumes sound and picture do importantly go together. 
we're going to be introducing you to some of these stakeholders. Hence, you'll hear from a film composer, two professors of philosophy who delightfully disagree on the answer to our question, Professor Mitch Green, who holds that there are natural affinities, and Professor Derek Matravers, who is suspicious that sense and effect cluster together in the way Green suggests. You'll also hear from a philosopher musician who has pursued her investigation using the medium of sound as well as critical thought. And we'll be hearing and seeing newly commissioned works from Tate artist Nicola de Vistula, who has exhibited her graphic notations internationally and who will perform three new works originated just for this conference. As our question concerns neurotypical experiences of multisensory artworks, it is helpful to understand how this might contrast with atypical, also called pathological experiences, such as synesthesia. So we'll also be hearing from Dr. Natalie Bowling, who has worked extensively with mirror-sensory synesthetes who experience conscious vicarious sensations of touch and pain. In the accompanying films, we investigate some answers to these questions by various means. We've interviewed each participant to get a sense of how the question is approached, and we're offering a number of pre-watch, pre-listen, and pre-read papers for you to digest in advance of the live panel event and keynote speech by Mitch Green on the 10th of July. Thank you for registering, and we look forward to seeing you at the conference.